DJ Fister. Matthew Rudy, you hey, are hey. either one of the most popular men in America today for golf teachers or <laughs> one of the most unpopular, <laughs> depending I, if you made the 177 <laughs> or not. <laughs> I like I like doing this one because I'm just one of the consultant people in the room doing the meeting, oh. but Ron, Ron Kasprisky has to take the the bullets. The bullets come for me and the heat. 50 best in the in the state list. So I'll get a few, but not as many as some of those other days. Uh, what, a, what do you want to describe the difference between like the way you do the 50 versus Golf Magazine does the 100? Because not, not sure. a lot of people realize the the difference. Sure, and I can tell you that the quickest way for me not to respond to your email is to send me an email where you're mad that you didn't make Golf Digest Top 100. We don't do Top 100. We do the, <laughs> the 50. Um, right. There's there's two ways that these lists get put together. In, in ours, it's a it's a peer evaluation system where there's uh, nominations and voting. And um, there's two ballots. There's state ballots and then the national, the, the, the 50 best ballot. So essentially you're getting, you know, it's like middle school or high school where you're either popular or you're not. And you're, you're, your peers uh, vote to, to uh, uh, and, and they give their thumb up or thumb down and, and we aggregate the totals. So right. um, is, it, is it a perfect way to do it? I don't, I don't know that it's a perfect way, but um, it, it's transparent. You know, it, it, there's not a, a group of people sitting somewhere saying, we think that this person should be on the list and this person shouldn't. It's strictly a, an aggregation of, uh, of vote totals. And then there's a, there's a national ballot and it's the same kind of thing. You, you, uh, every, everyone who's, who gets a ballot for this thing with, you know, it's in the thousands, they, they can um, vote for somebody in the top 50 on our ballot. And if there, there's some name that's out of nowhere that they want to, to uh, put forward and, and, uh, and, and and write in for themselves, they can do that too. And I mean, that's how Stan Utley, I think, made the list the first time. He wasn't, he wasn't, uh, he was just emerging and, and enough people supported it and he made it into the 50. So oh, that's um, cool. it's, uh, <clears throat> that, that, it's, a, it's a difficult process because, I, because I'm extremely sympathetic to the plight of the modern golf coach because the, the exposure that our list produces and the, and the validation that it, that it uh, produces, whether that's uh, justified or not, it's a, it's a big part of doing business these days. And uh, I get a lot of commentary from coaches that say, well, you know, if I, if, if I taught Tiger Woods, he'd shoot 65 every day. And you, you put somebody else above me who doesn't know as much as I do. And, and you and I have talked about this plenty. The, the amount you know is certainly important, but the way you communicate it is important. And the success your students have is important. And the, the, the way you present doing things like this is important. And the, the, you know, there's there's a lot of pieces that go into it, and 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 one of the the cool and satisfying things about being in this line of work for so long, I think this is my 24th year, is um, the definition of best has lots of facets to it. You know, um, if you want to sit and have a wonky, you know, tech conversation about uh, you know specific physics and things like that, there's coaches you'd want to talk to if there's <clears throat> You know, conversations you want to have about the art of coaching or you know uh, you know mentoring juniors or or bringing players from from elementary school onto the tour there's coaches you'd want to talk to you know and so all those pieces uh you know if, if there's a player that's a reclamation project i mean talking to pete cohen about you know, right. about henrik stenson is fascinating and you know that's a different conversation than you would have with with some other coach and and I'm lucky that my job lets me talk to people like you and talk to all those different kinds of coaches to get to get uh, you know to, to see which facet they their strongest in and, and, and some of them it's like poker players you know some of them have a lot of tools in the toolbox and some of them have one really powerful tool so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting interesting uh, thing to witness for sure that's right well we uh, we talked a lot last year I mean you can imagine this conversation is basically one of uh you know, I don't know, 50 we had um, yeah. through the quarantine with Mike. And, uh, you know, out of that was, uh, you know, came the ultimate golf lesson. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first one we did last year, you know, thanks to you and all the people that helped us was, um, was very much about the technical components, which is kind of what you've, you've touched on. And that's one of my listed points to discuss is, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, I'm just saying how to become a top teacher, not necessarily ranked as a top teacher, but how to be a great teacher. Um, I think you have to represent your own style somehow. Um, mm -hmm. but you know, it's, it's very much a kind of a question of mastery, right. In terms of, um, 
you know, just trying to be better all the time. Now, if you want advice on how to become more well-known on uh, Instagram, I'm definitely not the person. Uh, <laughs> I don't have very many followers. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, uh, trying to make an effort here. Um, but, you know, on the other side of it, um, you know, if you look, especially if you listen to, you know, the Kevin Kirk uh, interview the other day, I think it was terrific, right. um, especially in regards to what you just said is, you know, there's a lot of people sitting on the sidelines who, uh, you know, can see what Tiger Woods swing looked like on a video in right. 2000. They can see what it looks like now. You know, they, they can see the delta potentially and say, you know what, well, I can see there's a difference. Therefore, you know, spot the difference. I can make him better, right? But, you know, especially at that elite level, the, the ability to get the respect that you need in order to be able to communicate with that person is, is a part of it, right? But then there's also, oh, sure. like, like you said, you know, there's, there's the communication, there's the, the, the coaching, which I think, you know, if, you, if anyone didn't see um, me talking to Kevin Kirk, you know, that would be like the you know, ultimate golf coach in terms of you know, understanding the things outside of the, the technical realm. Right. Um, so, so, you know, you've got 50 teachers in the top 50 here and, you know, their, their styles are very different, right? And so it's, it, it's, it's just an interesting thing. So that's where we're going to go with the ultimate golf lesson two is, is try and represent that, that kind of spread of things, you know, add to the technical pieces, but we've got some interesting people. We'll have Kevin will talk and we've got vision 54 and things like that. So how do you, um, you know, how do you kind of approach that in terms of, um, recognizing the strengths of the different teachers that you have to deal with. I mean, you have to create different articles, you know, you've done a lot of books. How many books have you done, by the way? Third, uh, I mean, how many years did I say I've been doing this 20, 20, uh, I've been doing this 20 some years. And the first book I did was the complete idiot's guide to golf. You know, those orange books. I did one. Were with you Michelle. uniquely qualified? <laughs> I did one with Michelle, that book with Michelle McGann in 1995. So it's been a long, uh, a long I've done a lot of golf books. I've done uh, the, the mix has been fun. I, uh, golf Digest has been pretty generous to me. They they paid for me to get an MBA, so I went to business school. Um, I think it was ten years ago, about yeah, it's ten or fifteen years ago. And once that happened, it, it also that got me into the world of writing some business and peak performance kind of books too. So so being able to, I mean, not, not just the book stuff, but even going into articles and things like that, and and doing how to stuff. But, but mixed with peak performance and the mental side and the, the motivational side, I, you know, five years ago, I did a book with a Navy SEAL guy, you know, and, I, and um, to, to, to see that side of it too has is, is been a window into the, the coaching element of it, certainly at the tour level. And uh, right. I, I spent a lot of time with Hank Haney during the, the time that he was working with Tiger. And to hear some of the stories about how that worked was very interesting because it's as you know, it's not the the information delivery is not linear, and the way it's received is not linear. And so, right. um, and I'll and I'll use Jordan Spieth as a great example. I think it's very easy right now to pick on what Jordan Spieth is doing or not doing, and he's a yeah. professional. He's he's yeah. a tour. He's well, he's a tour player, and he's putting himself out there, and he and he collects all this money and endorsements and then prize money, and that's part of the deal is to get criticism. I'm sure. You know, Cameron McCormick knows that's part of the deal too to be to be to have what he's doing get picked at. But I'll never forget what Hank told me about working with Tiger, which is everybody likes to weigh in on what is working and not working, and how you know the coach must be a genius or the coach must be an idiot. Or but but the reality is that you're watching this relationship in in real time, and you don't know how much information a given player is um, receiving and accepting. And then how much of it they're using. So, so right. Hank tell, tells these fascinating stories about having these big, long conversations with Tiger, and he's just not receptive to anything they're talking <laughs> about. And then he'll go away for a couple of days and then come back and tell Hank that he's, come up, that he's discovered this amazing new thing that he's going to try. And it's the thing that they were talking about a, yeah. a few days ago. Yeah. Or he'll do something but do it like 25% of it. So if you're the coach and you're trying to communicate that to the player, do you then tell the player 400% of, of what you want them to do with the hopes that they adopt the amount that you want, or do you just sort of stay with what you're doing? And I think that's part of the artistry of coaching is understanding how to get that kind of stuff to grow inside the player and, and also be able to face the fact that the player is going to hold you 100% responsible for what works or doesn't work without necessarily giving you 100% of the attention or doing 100% of what you, what you ask. 
And also mix in the fact that they can do 300% of what you ask. Physically, they can do whatever you want them to do. And, right. and to be able to, to navigate those waters takes a special kind of coaching. And when you see a, a coach like Kevin or you see a coach like you, you know, a coach that's had that success replicated over several different players, you know, over time, it, it, I mean, that is, I think if, 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 if the average person asked me, what's the one thing that you wouldn't, um, that you don't notice on the superficial level when you're watching some of those player coach relationships is that part of it is much harder than people think. It's not like, Oh, look, his grip is messed up. If I just fix that, man, he'll, he'll shoot, you know, he'll shoot 64 tomorrow. Well, okay. I yeah. mean, that's, that's one piece of it, but there's a, there's a lot of pieces that go into it. And, and I think the coaches, and, and, and I always go back to this, it's, it's old news by now, not by now, but Randy Smith is one of my favorite people in all of golf. He, yeah. he coaches, he coaches in Dallas. He coached Justin Leonard from the time Justin was a, you know, six. Yeah. He's an and, incredible. And, him all the way to the, and, and he, and he did the same with Scotty Scheffler, you know, took, took Scotty Scheffler from elementary school to the, to the PGA tour. Yeah. And, and when you see someone like that, who not only knows what to teach, but can connect with these different kinds of players from the time that they're in elementary school up through being, you know, jerky teenage boys, like we were, like you right. and I both were, I'm sure to being college mm -hmm. players, to being young tour players, you know, the, the, just the, the emotional elasticity that it takes to, to, to survive all those changes in dynamic and also be able to provide this, this, you know, the positive stuff, I mean, Scotty Scheffler, I went and did a story with Randy when Scotty was in elementary school and he was pocket size. He's this little tiny kid Unreal. who couldn't hit it anywhere. And now he's a full grown human who can hit it as far as anybody. And just, just that dynamic changing is, is, yeah, funny, is fascinating. To he would have won a couple of majors last year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, yeah, you know, and I'm sure there'll be a, a tweet or something or an Instagram post where someone says, hey, if I got my hands on him for a day, he'd, you know, he'd be better than Bryson. Okay. okay. Let's yeah, see. right. It's, but that's so brutal, isn't it? I think, um, you know, the interesting thing is how, you know, we all as humans have different personality profiles. And, uh, you know, there's also matching different personality profiles of tour players, right? And they also have mm -hmm. different times that they need different things. And so, you know, the revolving kind of door of, uh, you know, who stays together for a longer period of time or, or not is, is, is so interesting. And I think, you know, there's been uh, kind of an evolutionary filter, right, of, of people like, you know, Butch, who, who, who really has, you know, just an incredible way of, of being with his players and understanding, you know, probably as well as anybody what to say at the right time and things like that. I, I'm just saying that because Matt Kilgariff just joined. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, part of the reason I started to do this is uh, I, I play with a guy the other day and he's like, how do you coaches even know, you know, learn what to do or is there even a training program? There isn't really. It's, it's kind of self, self-directed, right? Um, so in terms of coaching, I think there's, instead of a coach, uh, you know, leaning on their personality strengths necessarily, I think there's going to be the need if you're going to be at the top of the tree in 20 years to be a little bit more specialized. And specifically in terms of, um, you know, that what you're talking about in terms of kind of the wisdom, which comes from teaching a lot of people, but also the, the knowledge of, you know, coaching styles. So I think, you know, motor learning and understanding how to deal with human beings is something that is is probably going to be the future of um of what we're doing obviously we've got oh, like sure. you know, vision 54 and kevin kirk well, and people like this are sure. starting to really lean into it um but that's going to be an interesting piece and especially i think uh i can't remember who who i was talking to but going outside of golf uh you know and finding out how to do those things is going to be uh is going to be a cool piece too to your point you know i think we've talked a lot about uh, the book you wrote with the navy seal and and the lessons mm -hmm. that he learned on the way that potentially lean into our industry. Well, I, I think you're a thousand percent right. And I think what you're also, what you're describing is the difference uh, between kind of a one-off Providence type relationship where two people just happen to be simpatico yeah. and it works and something right. that's, you can replicate or teach or, mm -hmm. or to give to somebody else. I, you know, and um, I think there are, there are, over, you know, historically speaking, there have been relationships between players and coaches in lots of sports, not just golf, but where it wasn't even so much the, the, the content of the coaching, it was more of the emotional relationship between the people. And you had the benefit of strong personalities and really, you know, super high levels of athleticism that cover up a lot of flaws. But, right. but if you're talking about actually 
uh, determining what someone can know and can learn and can and, and, and measure how they improve from their baseline. There's no doubt that there are skills to know and there's, and there's no doubt uh, you know, we've spent lots of time talking about the research side of all this and the, and the scientists and the coaches that are super invested in, in knowing exactly what's happening. I mean, right. could, could you coach a, an elite athlete at the tour level who could physically do anything you asked and teach them something suboptimal and have it still work because you could coach them in a way that would make them believe that that was the right thing to do? Absolutely, you could. Uh, you know, where the, where the motor is not producing – as much horsepower as it could, but it's very predictable. Sure, that, that there's a, I think there's a path for that. But for the rest of us, uh, you know, humans and mortals, you know, having an understanding of the way things actually work and what happens when you introduce new pieces to the, you know, to the to the combination. I mean, how how is it possible to think that that's not important? You know, and, right. and it, if you don't know the causes and you don't know the effects. Then, then it's just random. You know, you're, you're, it's like my watching my six-year-old, you know, throw a bunch of blocks on the floor. Probably happens on a regular basis. You know, it might happen here. Yeah, you might hear it. It's, <laughs> it's probably happening now. Oh, that's funny. So how? Um, so you've seen, you know, people come onto your radar as uh, as young teachers. Uh, you know, Doug Spencer just came on there. Congratulations, Doug. Andrew Park, you're no longer young. No congratulations for you. <laughs> Um, I got a the, few of those emails. Yeah, guys, who's, oh, I'm, I, not, I'm not on that list. No, I'm old now. <laughs> so, um, so basically, you know, they come onto your radar at some point, and then, you know, what what kind of characteristics do you think the teachers show that move all the way through to? I mean, you've seen all the way through to the top fifty. Um, sure. You know, even top ten over the last ten years, right? So it's sure. so it's kind of uh, interesting how that evolution goes. I, it's it, it's interesting because there are two parts. To, there's two answers to that question, and there's the kind of the attractive answer and then there's the, the underbelly answer. And I think the underbelly answer is um, a, a lot of coaches probably believe that there are some elements to that that are either A, out of their control or B, more about promotion or, you know, do, you know doing something to stand out. And, uh, um, I mean, everybody wants to talk about George Gankis and whether he deserves to be in the top 50 or not. And and I think the the, the cool thing about George Gankis is that you, you can answer yes to all those questions. You know, he has a, a very distinctive look and he, and he produces material that's memorable when you, when you watch it and he coaches people that win golf tournaments. And so, so you can, you can criticize him for, for some of those different things, but if you're going to criticize him for being a no substance kind of a teacher, that doesn't match up with Matt Wolf being a fantastic golfer. Unbelievable. And, right. and, so and having the um, having the capacity to not make change when it doesn't oh, necessarily sure. look like everybody else is an incredible skill, right? Ab Leaving absolutely. it alone is as hard as making a change. Absolutely, and I think the other point. the other the, the other part that's so difficult about this sport, and and um, the, it's a the painful part of it for me. I, I have three daughters. I, I have three daughters that are twelve and younger. And the, and the painful part about this sport is that in many ways, it's very old fashioned and backward. I don't think women have been treated particularly well in this sport. You know, I mean, pick, pick your, pick your uh, less advantaged group. That's, that's not, you know, relatively wealthy, uh, you know, white guys. I mean, and, right. and, and I think that extends into the, the way the sport is thought about and the way golf instruction is thought about. And, um, I think it's less so here in the last few years. There's been more openness to new ideas because people have seen what someone like Bryson DeChambeau can do when you say, well, I'm not going to put any constraints on what I do. I'm just going to look at what the data tells me and what's possible. And I'm going to go try that. And, um, but I think for a lot of years, there's the, the orthodoxy of, of thinking about the way people hit a golf ball or thinking about the way people teach golf has, has led our sport in general to reject people who come at it from a different angle, who look a little bit different, right. who talk in a different way, who, who reach out to people in different ways. I mean, the, right. you know, wh whether you're talking about Joe Mayo doing track man maestro on Twitter, I mean, right. everybody knows he's not, he's never been my favorite character, but you have to give credit to what that, that was in terms of a step toward, broadcasting golf instruction to people that were not necessarily traditional consumers of golf instruction. That's a great thing. And, yeah. and so, so that's, that's one piece of it that, that a, 
that, that a coach that went up through the con conventional ranks and was an assistant pro and mentored under somebody who was fantastic, they're going to probably push back on some of that stuff and say, hey, I, I did it the right way. These right. other people are just, you know, they're popping off on Twitter and they're getting a lot of exposure. Um, <clears throat> but, but I think those tracks work in parallel. You know, the, the, you know if, if you worked and you, and you worked super hard and, and, and went and learned as if you were a sponge and you learned as much as you could, um, I think of a guy, CJ Nafis in New Jersey, you know, you know, it's his mission to go around to all these different coaches in around New Jersey to Mike Jacobs out on Long Island and go find out what, what the, what the right. people who are doing research on the golf swing are doing and, right. and actually apply it to your own, to your own business. <clears throat> That's just as I important think, as the other piece, as the social piece. Yeah. If you look back, you've got, um, you know, ex kind of David Ledbetter teachers and definitely mm -hmm. Jim McLean teachers that, you know, could in those days, it was like, well, you know, they were leaning on the name. But what those two organizations kind of encouraged was to go around. And even to this day, I think, you know, the ex um, you know, McLean guys are, you know, it's almost like they compete with each other as to how many, sure. how many of the great teachers they can go and visit, which is, I think it's a great thing. So I have a lot of Oh, I think I think I think yeah. Jim Jim has done a tremendous job. <clears throat> all those people that work for Jim are are amazingly well prepared to do yeah. the jobs that they go on to in golf because he drills into them on Monday. You have to understand the person who won the tournament yesterday, what does that player do? Right. Your your, your students are gonna ask you, you know, what what what's good, right. bad, or indifferent? You know, somebody comes in on Monday and is trying to like, you know, take the club back and, and flatten it all out like Dustin Johnson and, you know, do something weird with their swing because they saw it on TV. That's you have right. to understand <laughs> what that is. And, um, and, and I think it's, he, he is militant about making sure those, those coaches are prepared for the things that they're going to encounter. And so it isn't a surprise to me that a lot, so many of those coaches or, or so many coaches that have been mentored by Mike Adams go, go out and do well because it's not just that he's those those coaches have said specifically here's this here's the methodology you should teach. What those coaches have done is said to the coaches that work with them. It's important for you to un, to understand and be able to ask questions about things you don't you, that you don't understand, and to be right. open to new information. And that that's the huge thing. It's being open to to new and improved information as it comes out for sure. Yeah, I think you know Mike obviously uh, um, is is unbelievable. I mean he's. I would guess he's given more lessons than anybody else. Um, yeah. You know, he's 66. Rand, Randy's right up there too, the two of those guys. Yeah, I mean. Mike is, uh, and Kevin Kirk as well, the other day we were talking about, um, which is a is a, a common trait, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's one thing to be kind of known, but the other thing is just to be really passionate about what you're doing. Those guys share it. And, you know, Mike is unbelievable. Um, just, you know, if he finds a better idea tomorrow, then he's he'll drop something he's been doing for 50 years mm -hmm. and just move forward as if it never happened. And it's, uh, you know, that passion to, uh, you know, just continually improve is, is obviously under the hood is one of the, one of the key things that I think, um, you know, the top 50 teachers will share with each other. Yeah. I, I think uh, one just joined us there. Hello. I, Juice I, there's Tony. <laughs> I was just texting back and forth with Tony this morning. I, 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 and, and Tony's a great example of exactly what we're yeah. talking about. And, and I, I think, it's important to mention too the ego piece of it. And uh, when you when you talk to Tony, he's a great example. And, and Tony says, you know, I, when I when I'm when I was starting out and I had a guy who was in the U.S. Open for the first time, I made a beeline for Butch Harmon and said, hey, you know, can I walk with you a little bit to see what you do because I want I want to make sure that I'm able to give my guy as, as much as I can. And and Tony right. has been outspoken about the fact that he that will send video of one of his players to other coaches he trusts just to get a second yeah. look because to him, the important thing is that player getting better. It's not to right. be able to crowd everybody out and say, Hey, look, I'm the one who fixed you all by myself. And um, right. I, I almost see that like a doctor patient relationship, which is it doesn't matter who gets credit for taking the tumor out, the tumor's out and you're not, and you're not going to die. And, uh, That's right. and, and I, I respect that a lot because in the world of tour players, you know, there, there, there are some strong personalities and tour players have the, their quirks. And, and it is, and I, and I bet you there are times when it, and when it would feel like the right thing to do would be to try to, you know, to, to promote yourself a little bit internally to, to make sure that may, that relationship is maintained. But that's not always the, 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 the best thing for the patient, so to speak. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, tour players is, is a funny thing that, you know, where do they get their information? Again, they don't really care, you know, who gets credit for it. They just want to play better. So, you know, I was going to ask you a question. Uh, you talked about Jim McLean asking, um, you know, his players to be up to date on what happened on the mm -hmm. weekend. Um, isn't it interesting how over time even, you know, if you look back at, um, you know, the 70s, uh, probably, you know, I, I mean, top player has always been very influential, right? I think the 70s, you've got kind of the reverse C, um, you know, 80s, 90s, the videos came in, you know, so those are different reference frames. But isn't it interesting how, you know, the tour remains to be, you know, if you look at it like monkey see, monkey do, such a dominant force in terms of how people do what they do. You know, so if we got Dustin Johnson here, it's going to be world number one for, you know, a significant period of time. It's unavoidable that, you know, people are going to be teaching, you know, lead, Bowie lead wrist and, uh, and become a better athlete, things like that. So it talk to, you know, how, um, you know, media over time has, has had such a big influence on, on how people approach uh, teaching, you know, as coaches, but, but also just people picking it up kind of monkey see, monkey do fashion. Yeah, I think that works. That works at two levels. I think it works at the tour level. Um, I, I know Victor Hovland spent all of December trying to swing 120 because yeah. everybody discovered that uh, probably the penalty for firing at it as hard as you could is not as great as people might have anticipated before. Because Bryson broke the U.S. Open. You know, he, he just showed that 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 speed covers up a lot of other issues. And so at the tour level, there's mm -hmm. definitely I think, especially among younger players, the idea that uh, you, you can look and see what's worked out in the wild and try to, to adapt some of that to what you're doing. But you're, 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 you're very right about the, the, the prevailing trend on the tour trickling down. And, and I mean, this, I mean, never was it more evident. I mean, you can use stack and tilt as an example. I mean, stack and tilt had a, had a Renaissance on the tour. And that was, that was something that a lot of average players tried because I think the, the 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 basic thing about golf that we all know is that golf's hard. I mean it's hard it's hard to right. be consistent. It's hard to hit good shots. And and I also think I mean my kids are eating lunch here right now because of the fact that golf is hard to master and there's lots of different ways to go about getting better. And I've spent twenty some years trying to you know serve up what some of those 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 flavors are. And I mean I don't think we've ever been in a better spot than we are now because of the confluence of the quality of equipment, which makes the game more enjoyable for the average person, um, plus better uh, information that's backed up with better stuff. I think if you're a, if you're a run-of-the-mill uh, golfer out in the middle of America somewhere, your access to instruction is is so much better than it was 10 or 15 years ago because the baseline level of understanding and the baseline level of information that's available, whether it's going into a, a video seminar with someone like you or someone like Mike or someone like David Ledbetter. I mean, those things were reserved for people that had to fly across the country or go, go work for Randy Smith for 10 years at Royal Oaks to get to. And now you can actually find that stuff out there and incorporate it. The trick that we're going to run to now is, is yeah. trying to sift through some of it to, to make sure yeah. that the, the best stuff kind of moves up to the top. I was talking to a guy the other day who, you know, he's a retired young oil trader. And, you know, we were just I want talking that about job. The can I, right? can I quit, well, can anymore, I quit what I do and do that? Right? So well, how did you do it? And he goes, well, the delta was, uh, um, you know, the delta was that, you know, we knew what the oil prices were in certain places and we could buy it at a different price in a different mm -hmm. place because we had guys there, right? So so the interesting thing is I think the delta in, in golf instruction, I think the, the really, really bad golf instruction is – probably a lot less than it used to be, you know, so the, it's like the target's getting a little bit smaller. Um, so I think, you know, Instagram and YouTube and technology has really helped us, you know, raise the baseline level of, yeah. of golf instruction. And then, so therefore, I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, trading, it's like, you know, it's the, it's the ability to uh, trade quickly in their case. So in our mm -hmm. case, it's, you know, to, do you get to the point quick enough versus somebody else? Um, or, or develop other skills, right? Which, I, you know, is the reason I think that um, Kevin Kirk had a great saying the other day, you know, we squeezed as much as we can out of golf instruction. You know, obviously, you know, Mike and I are really uh, working hard to try and squeeze a bit more, but um, 
Uh, but at the same time, you know, the delivery of the message to make sure it gets across in the right way at the right time, you know, stuff like that is, is becoming more and more interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, the, when our book comes out, you know, it'll, it'll make the amount that's going to be uh, squeezed uh, be a little bit less. So, oh, sure. And I, and I, and I yeah. think to also the, there's no doubt that there's a lot more uh, opportunities and there's a lot more great information out there, but, you know, the, the other, the, the one problem with that is there's a lot more information out there. And I think a, a big part of what coaches need to be able to do now is, is, is to be a, you know, to, to, to be a curator for their student, because right. you, you can, you can go to YouTube and see there's, there's 1.2 million slice fix videos on YouTube. And <laughs> that's right. There's not enough time <laughs> in a year to look at those videos and to figure out not just what, what what slice tips are good because lots of slice tips are good what slice tips are good for you and right. that's the challenge for anyone who's trying to to communicate this way you know in this in the digital medium which has been fantastic i mean where else i mean if you if you close your eyes and picture pictured yourself 10 years ago and, and you could you could have access to almost unlimited golf genius, whether it's a player, a coach, you name it, a, right. a, peak, a peak performance coach, a Navy SEAL, uh, an Olympic athlete, a right. CEO, wherever. We, ha we have, you know, a, a fire hose of insight just on a Twitter feed or an Instagram feed right. from all these different, you know, genius level people. But, you know, some, some of the advice is conflicting. Some of it is incomplete. Some of it isn't great for you, but might be great right. for me. And so – the, the, the fun part of what you do and what I do now is to try to come up with a unifying, uh, not a unifying theory of, of you know, it's, it's not like you're, you're creating the, a textbook where this is the only information that's, that people should know. Right. It's, here's the, it's, it's like the Dewey Decimal System. Here's the entire landscape of information. Right. Some of this right. over here is interesting for you. Some of this over here is interesting for you. We're going to be the one right. that kind of gives you the path to, to figure out how to, how to do something satisfying for yourself because I don't think there's anything less satisfying than to, for example, to go to the driving range and to watch a coach give a lesson to the person in the bay next to you. And they give that person something. And all of a sudden the person starts striping it and you're sitting there in your bay and you go, well, wow, that, that's the answer. And all of a sudden, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm six, six, you know, three 30, 48 years old, strong, but not particularly flexible. And I, you know, and, I, and I'm watching a 12 year old, my, my 12 year old daughter get a lesson and there's something that, that that's perfect for her. And I go in my 48 year old, not flexible self and try to do it. And it makes me, you know, hit left, you know, grounders out, you know, out, you know, off the left field foul pole or whatever, you know, that, that frustration is real and it happens every day in golf because people are trying to apply the wrong solution to the correct problem. Right. So I think that's what we're doing, you know, with the ultimate golf lesson seminar is, you know, there was a, I can't remember who it was. It was, I think it was an old British guy. So the purpose of education should be to make you think, right? So, so to your point, I think creating the vessel is a really good concept. You know, we try to create from a technical standpoint, no outliers. So we say, okay, you know, across the board, there is all sorts of golf swings we can, you know, run some tests and work out where, where within that spectrum, where should you be? Um, but I think, you know, what we're trying to do now is trying to create a situation where, um, you know, and I think Kevin Kirk did a really good job of it again the other day um, of talking about different areas within the game, different avenues that you can go down to be a better coach. And, and that seems to be going that way more and more. Whereas in the old days, it's almost like old education, you would say, um, uh, I'm not going to name any teaching styles, but you do a teaching style, you do that robotically you know, because that's the thing at that point in time, or that's the teacher that you got exposed to, or that's what's popular. Oh, sure. Um, whereas nowadays, I think, you know, so, so when I watch people teach, because I've been around for a long time, and I've been really thinking about it, obviously, in an OCD way for a long time, uh, you know, I can pretty much tell watching a teacher where they got their information. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I was staying at um, PJ National over there, and I was watching a guy. Oops, shouldn't say anything. But, um, but he basically, you know, from 100 yards away, on my balcony, I, I could see the remnants of a George Gankus lesson, remnants of a, you know, stack and tilt lesson. And then well, uh, I, I, it was I, almost I, like at the end, he reverted back to kind of a, uh, um, oh, 
who's who's Jack Nicholas's guy up in uh... Jack Crow? Yeah, uh, no, uh, not Jack. Uh, the guy who who's you remember the argument between um, uh, Jimmy Ballard and so one was the body guy, one was the arms guy. Oh, he's really oh, uh, Jim I'm Jim Flick. Yeah, so Jim, it was the Jim last Flick. part of it was you know you got the guy to you know stick his left arm out and swing the club under it, which was more like you know kind of a golf digest schools thing. So it was it was just you know really interesting. But Whereas I, I, fifteen yeah. years ago, I went out to to Carmel. And I spent an entire day watching Ben Doyle give lessons. Mm -hmm. And this I used is to not have a, lessons it, from Ben. This is not a knock on Ben Doyle at all because there's a lot of, not only a lot of players that played better with Ben, but a lot of coaches who were strongly influenced by Ben. But right. I watched him give literally the identical lesson to an eight year old lady, to a aspiring tour pro, to a you know it was from from the first thing they did getting in the bunker to drawing the lines to the second yeah, thing they yeah, did yeah. to the third thing they did. It was exactly the same lesson because his belief was that the machine, you know, the golfing machine worked the same for every player. And um, again, you can only, you can only work with what you have and what you know, and to apply the same standards to somebody in 1940 or 1960 or 1980 to what we have available to us now is not fair, but, um, all you can do in my seat or in your seat is to see see what's out there and see what's coming and and try to synthesize it and improve improve the system. But and uh, well, I think I don't, the, I don't think I don't know. think restricting I don't think restricting your viewpoints and saying I you know it, it, it's it's like the argument when people say are you a are you a technical coach or are you more of an old school like a you know an yeah, artist yeah, yeah. and a, as if as if somehow you know Randy Smith is sitting there at Royal Oaks and there's track man data that comes in that says this person is launching this shot X, Y, Z. And he's going to say, no, I, I refuse to, 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 to hear this information. I won't use it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to watch him with my head turned sideways. That's not the way it works. I mean, the, the best coaches will take the information wherever they can get it and figure out the best way to communicate it to the student. Yeah. I think that, uh, that reinvention of yourself as a great coach is, is, is an important thing and uh, appreciation of the facts. I mean, look at technology change. Um, over time, obviously, initially, we only had the ball, you know, in our eyes, and then we had a video camera. And then we have, you know, launch monitors. And then we have, uh, you know, motion capture, and we have force plates. And each of those different kind of lenses um, enabled us to, to see things in different ways. And if you were like Mike, you know, uh, willing to, to put the time in to really understand the things that are coming back at you, then you know you could incorporate them into the things that you already knew worked, but maybe make sense of how to dose that information, mm -hmm. you know, right time, right place. But I think the interesting thing um, I was going to say is, you know, science is really the act of measuring something. And you know, if you look at um, the last ten or fifteen years since we've had technology, and also uh, Mark Brody's, you know, information, then the the game is a little less opaque than it once was. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's still a long way to go for the, you know, for the information to kind of filter down through the system. Um, but the more that, you know, more things are measured, uh, I think the the delta between kind of camps and golf is, is going to unify, right? I mean, te you know, technology, I think, makes teaching more consistent and it allows, you know, a swing like Matt Wolf to come out on tour and not be changed because now the reference right. frame for him was, was as much the ball as it was the swing, as far as I understand. And, you know, whereas if, if your reference frame was the seventies and the eighties and the nineties, where there's, you know, video cameras coming into the system, then, you know, those were more abstract lessons, right. In terms of how hey, your swing mm -hmm. needs to look better. And we didn't have a way to measure the ball, you know, for a while there. And, uh, you know, potentially, you know, trying to squeeze everyone into a, middle range of video was, was tricky. So it's, so it's interesting how yeah. technology has changed things and will continue to change things at an increasing rate over the next five years. Oh, th there's no doubt. And um, it also makes me laugh too. <laughs> you and I have talked about this. The, I think a lot of the, the arguments and the conversations in the nerdy inner circle of golf instruction are, are like the political arguments that people have been get, getting into these days which is that it's very easy to paint people that don't think the same way you do with a, this broad brush as if somehow a coach that doesn't have um, a gear system or force plates right out on the tee and, and using them every minute is not 
up, you know, up to date and what they're, you know, how they're helping someone. And on the other hand, uh, a technologically advanced teacher doesn't even look at the student as just staring at a screen and doesn't, you know, can't, in, can't interpret, can't interpret emotions when, it's when the reality, yeah, when the reality is just like in politics, you know, there's, there's crazy people on both sides of that spectrum. You know, there's, there's horse whisper coaches that don't know anything about the technology of the swing and aren't helping people very much. And there's, you know, nerdy tech coaches that have only ever coached inside and never saw a ball play and are staring at a screen. But are those the normal experiences that you're having when you go, I mean, take, take the slice of the top 10% of coaches in the country. That just isn't the experience that you're having when you go to coaches on any part of that spectrum. And, and the, the beautiful part about this is that you can go find coaches in either, you know, all along that spectrum that suit your personality. If you want right, to go and, right. and watch right. 500 of your own swings and have this deep dive intensive PhD thing, you can do that. If you want right. to go and, and hear somebody tell stories and, 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 and sort of um, insinuate the information into your subconscious, you can, you can do that too. And uh, I think where, we're, where we get the advantage in this sport is at the baseline level of information to start from. For example, if you're a 20, 20 year old or 22 year old golf instructor right now, the baseline level of knowledge about human body, muscles, movement, baseline information about the physics of, of how the, the club ball interaction happens, the, what the club is actually doing in space as it moves around your body and the things, right. and the things that you can impart upon that club to make it do something, we're starting at such a, a much more sophisticated level than, you know, this idea that you should just go out there and let centrifugal force make the club do what it's supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, so that's, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> um, yeah. But I think, you know, you're going to find that, you know, the greatest coaches that, you know, who continue getting results are definitely going to be, you know, plus or one minus one standard deviation that they're, they're not usually, I mean, the guys like way out on the ends might be more of a consultant style, um, mm -hmm. you know, come and check my stuff. And then at some point, the players also could transition back into playing golf. Um, so it's really interesting. I think, you know, we keep talking about Bryson DeChambeau, um, not only because of what he's done, um, you know, with, with trying to get more distance. I mean, the, the reason he's getting trying to get more distance is obviously because of the, you know, incredibly heavily weighted importance of it on score. Um, but I think what's going to happen is he's going to continue to go through and try and take a, you know, I think he said it's called a deep dive, you know, where he's going to try and deconstruct each part of the, the game to, to try and get the edge using his, you know, his, his team to, to do that. And that kind of represents who Como is as well, of course, because, you know, you and I spent a lot of time with Chris, you know, his show has been interesting where he, he almost is in a similar place. It's like, let's not try and, uh, understand this too quickly. Let's just make sure we right. we really really understand the background and maybe you know at that entry point we can take a different path. So the the two of them match up really well together because they're trying not to to take the path that is well traveled rather than you know really explore and and obviously so far you know what uh, what Bryson has done with adding speed and approaching the game obviously paid off with such a incredible win at the the US Open which I don't think any of us could have predicted that the bomber was the the way to play it but in hindsight it actually kind of made sense that it was like the epitome of the bomb and gouge theory right well I, I think that the, the 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 I can't believe I'm going to use this word but I will the beautiful the beautiful thing about Bryson is even if you don't like what he's doing if, if you're a purist and you don't like that he's rendered wing foot obsolete or you don't like the hat he wears or you don't like you know the gaining all the muscle or you don't like you know you don't like his answers or interviews what, whatever your whatever your complaint about him is the, the beautiful thing about what he's doing is he's showing a willingness to examine every facet right and, That's to, th point, and right? to and to throw out um and to discard folklore you know where that's golf a good one. I use the filled, word mysticism. So exactly. mysticism and filled, folklore. Right. Golf is filled with folklore. You know, the yeah. putt breaks toward the ocean, whatever. Pick your, pick your folklore. <laughs> and he's decided to examine every piece of it. And he has the capacity to do that. He's not married, doesn't have a kid, doesn't, you know, he's not, you know, he doesn't have three other kids doing Zoom, Zoom right. school in the next in room. In the other room. You know, like, 
<laughs> right. And so, so he has the bandwidth to do it. He has the time, he has the money, he has the inclination, right. he has the wiring to do it. He has the coordination and the talent and the power. And you know, all those pieces came together with a coach that could feed that for him. And so he made great choices all along the way. And he was willing to, to, to put up with the pain that comes with that. I mean, this is a guy that is relentless yeah. and he hits thousands of balls and he's, he's the last guy on the range every night. And you can see that just getting at 90% or 95% is torment for him. So I don't know that any of us would want that for ourselves, but it's amazing to watch someone who does want that for himself and to, and, and he's doing the hard work. He's like the icebreaker, you know, the, the boat that goes and cracks up all the ice so they can clear the shipping channels. He's the icebreaker who's said, okay, I can, I've shown you guys now what's possible. It's up to you to decide if you want to chase me or not, but you know, I'm going to go do my thing. And I think that that trailblazing is great for, I think it's great in business. I think it's great yeah. in sports. I think it's, I think it, you know, Jeff Bezos, you can say whatever you want about Amazon, but you know, this is a guy who had an idea that transformed the way we operate. You know, I, I, my wife has these, these hot uh, sliced peppers that she likes and we, and we don't even think about going to the grocery store to get them because we know that they're 15 bucks and we get a regular shipment of them every two weeks right. from Amazon. So if you'd had that conversation with somebody 10 years ago, Hey, there's this hot pepper you like, and they're going to ship it to you every two weeks. You'd think that was insane, but guess right. what? It's not insane. And uh, I think that it, it, it is very exciting for golf. It's very exciting for golf instruction, but it's also very daunting for, for players and daunting for coaches because I think too, the dirty little secret in golf instruction is that the answers are there to be known. And if you don't know them um, or better yet, if you, you know, what, what is happening when the club hits the ball can be measured. So if you're telling someone something is happening or predicting something's going to happen, it is knowable that it's happening or not happening. And I think that's what? threatening to a lot of coaches as it should be. And it, and it, and it pr promotes a lot of conversation about kind of like the soft side of the game. Well, you know, you might not be hitting his driver as good this year, but look at the decisions he's making when he's playing. Oh, okay. I mean, all those things are pieces of it. Right. But the reality is the ball is doing what the player wants it to do more often or not. I mean, that's, we can, we know. Yeah, that. I think the taking the dive and, and being able to measure things, it, you know, at first it's confusing, but for example, if somebody chooses to go down a certain path and they measure, you know, using all the devices available to them, what they're doing and they go down that path and it doesn't work, then they left themselves a bread trail, which I think is something which has happened at the elite level over the years is, People own, you know, it, it is like a schoolyard on some level that they're, they are looking at each other and they are, you know, copying the coolest cat or the, the guy that's making the most money, you know, even on a subliminal level. But I think, you know, knowing exactly who you are as a player, both as a coach and a, and a player is, is important too, right? And so I think, you know, the, the history of players, you know, looking for distance or changing their game to become more consistent, you know, whatever it is, um, is riddled with, you know, people that don't come back and, you know, measuring things actually obviously helps understand where you were and, and, you know, helps you to come back if you go down a path that is, is not exactly designed sure. for you. So that's kind of well, a, a different way of looking at the technology is, is to yeah. create just a description. And I, sure. And I, and I think you're right. And I also, I believe too, that if you're, in this era, Colin Morikawa, Victor Hovland, Matt Wolf, you know, the, this era that we're in now, players that grew up, TrackMan is a part of life. And, and go, right. I, I hate to keep going back to Randy, but Randy's awesome. Randy Smith once told me, he said, you know, the interaction you have with junior players has to acknowledge the fact that, that people of that age grow up on devices and they right. grow up technology conversant. So. Right. Um, th that reality informs how those players grew up. They're, they're comfortable with using a high speed, you know, the, 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 the camera on your iPhone right now, the one that we, I'm talking to you on and that you're talking to me on is better than any university level equipment five years ago, anyone could have ever had. And right, the ability to, to, to shoot, to, to, to shoot your swing, to see what happens, to interact with a track man through your own device, to have a, you know, to, to coach remotely, to do all these different things that are possible now. 
it, those those players are coming up with a baseline level of comfort with technology and data and analysis and um, and interacting with coaches in a less traditional way that number one makes those breadcrumb kinds of things easier to deal with, like you said. And number two, right. I think it 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 makes the the coach and player relationship a lot more elastic. It, you know, it isn't just two people ensconced out on the range by themselves having, you know, developing this weird kind of, you know, in a cave relationship. And, and I think that's great for golf too. I, I think having more fully realized human beings out there um, learning things from different kinds of coaches and, you know, and having right. their own kinds of experiences. Brooks Kepka is a great example. That guy went and played the mini, he played the, the European challenge tour right. and had to book himself in his own hot youth hostel and right. go drink beer in the local little place. And I think that that fact and that experience for a year did so much more to develop him into a, a confident player than, you know, burying himself on the back of the range at, a, at the Bears Club and hitting a yeah. million golf balls. And, and just, you know, with his buddies, right? I, I absolutely 100% agree. I think there's, uh, uh, you know, the incredible life experience, you know, which, you know, playing golf at the highest level is... Uh, is, is being able to deal with some amount of adversity and it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be in golf that you learn adversity. Right. And so yep. as I always say to people, you know, going to the Asian tour is, is, you know, everything is different. Culture is different. Food is different. Travel grasses, but it's competitive. And, you know, European challenge tour is unbelievable. The number of countries they, they go to and, and all the different experiences. So I think that, you know, who's to say that's, that's not, you know, shaped some of who he is now when he's under, you know, he's competing. It's pretty cool. For sure. And, and, and it also makes selfishly, it makes for much more interesting interviews. You know, it makes it make you yeah. know, when, you're, when you're talking to somebody who's not a robot, that's right. more interesting when you're talking to a player and you've had this experience when you when you go out and talk to different players, there's two levels. There's the players that know a lot of stuff, but don't want to reveal that they know it because they want to see what you know. And then there's right. players that don't actually know any of that stuff. And they're not curious. And, they're, you know, they're well, I just I just I, all I want to do is go hit the ball. I don't want to think about it too much. And, and I think the um, I'm not saying that you have to have a physics major to be a professional athlete because you certainly don't. But um, when you when you talk to a, a player that's a little more multifaceted, Matt Wolf, Victor Hovland, you know, when you when you go talk to those players and they have some kind of awareness about what's happening in the greater world of golf and you see the critical thinking that is involved with that, you can't help but think that that critical thinking skill is an advantage in a in a ever increasing ever increasingly information world right. sport and and, and right. as you were saying so well earlier you know there are so, there, the, as the sport gets filled up with more and more athletes and people who can all hit the ball far and people can all hit the ball close the the skills that separate those players are, are you know they're they're tinier and tinier the, the the space to find that delta is more and more difficult to find i mean just look at the the you know double bogey you know obviously i watch a lot of uh leaderboards a guy could be or a lady could be in 18th place to make a double bogey and miss the cut you know because yeah. i think that would be fair to say is that you know the the difference between the top and the and the middle is 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 a lot smaller than it ever was the more and more people can win but no, I, um, I think any, anybody who says that PGA Tour golf, like the golfers on it, like like the 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 average player in professional golf in 2020 is not better than the average player in 1950. Go go play in a in a Monday qualifier for a PGA Tour event and get back to me. Tell me how many times. Yeah, 60, I think 63 didn't get you in. That's you right. Know, the, there's the so there's so definitely. many good players. But we had that chat with uh, Gary Player, of course, and. Uh... You know, he, he listed a, a whole bunch of unbelievably great golfers who are at the top of the tree then. Um, but I think the difference is, um, as you said, the, the depth is, is just unbelievable. Yeah, it's uh, – well, I, and I, I, I don't – there's no uh, – I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying Gary's wrong. Gary's perspective <laughs> comes from Gary's perspective. I'm just saying that this – this idea, and I'll just say it out loud, and maybe Brandel will shoot me or somebody. I don't know, but, but I don't know. I don't, I don't know that he and I are on the opposite sides of this. But if if you want to stipulate that a five foot eight, chain smoking guy in full on pleated slacks and a you know burlap golf shirt 
can do something better physically than six foot three Olympic level athlete right. guy, you're welcome to to take that view. I, I don't think that's the case. My grandfather played nose tackle for the Iowa Navy pre-flight school in 1943, and he was six two two o five. And if he was blocking JJ Watt, I wouldn't be here because he'd be dead. My grandfather would have died. <laughs> right. and that, I mean, that's just reality. So. Um, and that's not a criticism of the era that those players played in. It's just an, an example of everything we're talking about. The, the things physically that these players can do, you've, you've experienced it. I mean, the, you go and coach a guy who's having trouble. The issue is, is not that he can't do what someone is suggesting that he do. The problem is he's doing seven other things that don't necessarily work together. And right. I mean, I did photo shoots with Phil Mickelson, where if you gave him a shovel, he could hit a bunker shot with a That's shovel. Right. It's not the <laughs> issue is not lack of talent. It's it's deciding what needs well, to be what needs to be, what fix needs to be applied, and giving the person the belief that they can do it when it's important. Well, it's sifting through the noise, isn't it? Yeah. So I mean, it's, so let me ask you one more question. I know you got your sure. your family to get back to there. Um, so I'm going to add this question to all the interviews in the future. What is the ultimate golf lesson? <laughs> I I think well there's two answers that I'll, for myself I think for the recreational player the the answer to that has to, a lot to do with what you're hoping to get out of your game and 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 golf for yourself and I think the best coaches understand what the ultimate goal is for the ultimate golf lesson and there and there definitely is some element of skill improvement in that um but the, but the degree of that is different for every player. Um, but the, to me, the ultimate golf lesson is a coach who, who understands where I'm trying to get to, to enjoy the game the way I want to enjoy it. And they give me the roadmap to that enjoyment. And, and as a person who doesn't get to play enough because of all the little kids, I mean, my, my golf is four whole rounds, you know, where kids, the, the, it's the attention span of an 11-year-old. And so the ultimate golf lesson for me is different than it would have been when I was 25 and I, you know, I wanted to shoot 74. Um, but the, but I think the, the ultimate golf lesson is um, applying the, the ideal solution to the problem at hand. And, and it, that's not a, that's not a cookie cutter solution for every player. And, and the best coaches are the ones that have a big toolbox of solutions and they're wise enough to understand what solutions go with which problem. Right. I think that was something that Kevin Kirk said was uh, is a really, you know, understanding the, the person in front of you. I mean, obviously, we do that with testing, yeah. um, but, you know, from a personality standpoint and also matching up uh, expectations. So I think the, the, the initial part of the golf lesson is, is important in terms of creating the ultimate mm -hmm. result is because it has to match who you are, you know, on many levels sure. and get to the point really quickly. And then that would be my summary of that. So Matt, awesome. Thank you. I know you're a very busy man and, uh, uh, I'm really pleased you came on because you really do have some cool perspectives of your uh, 50 years in the career in the, in the business. <laughs> yeah, but you're but you're the one your who's sitting looks in, very colorful. Considering you're, you're, you're the one who's sitting in Hawaii, though. I'm the one who's in 21 degrees in Connecticut. Well, I'm also ready 21 to go. degrees. It's 21 Celsius here. <laughs> yeah, but you're, you're in Hawaii, about to go play golf. I'm in Connecticut, getting ready to go supervise an online gym class for a for a first grader. <laughs> Well, you know, they're very grateful. Just imagine the gratitude that's coming back at you. <laughs> yeah, well, it's always good to talk to you, sir. Yeah, nice to talk to you. Thanks for your time, buddy. Sure. All the best.